Dear Video Professional, The elements of this videotape represent the work of creative professionals like yourself. Unauthorized duplication of this tape not only is a federal crime, but also contributes to the destruction of an industry that you help create. Please do your part by not duplicating this videotape. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tony Shannon from Sunrise Industries, maker of Studio 16. Today in this tape, we'll show you some of the basic functions of Studio 16, such as recording and editing, as well as some of the more specific functions, such as the non-destructive fades and crossfades. We'll do this by doing our own video project. We'll create a five-track soundtrack for a movie trailer. This entire movie that we're taking the trailer from had its soundtrack done in Studio 16. But first, let's take a look at the hardware. This is the AD516. The AD516 has two inputs, two outputs, and a SEMPTI input. So this is stereo. Studio 16 can come with either this board, the AD516, or the AD1012. Virtually the only difference is that the AD1012 has only one input and one output, so it's mono. Today we'll be working with the AD516. It's stereo, eight tracks, and digitizes in 16-bit. Well, now let's get into the software. This is the Studio 16 About window, and it's got some useful information on it, but we'll get back to that later. The first thing we need to do to build our soundtrack is to record our samples onto the hard drive. I have some samples here on DAT, and I'm going to show you how to get them off the DAT and just record them right onto your hard drive using Studio 16. So I'll load the tape into my DAT player. And now we'll open up the record module in Studio 16. We get that from our applications menu, and we just pull down and open it up. And here's our recorder. Now let's turn on the monitor so that we can hear incoming sounds. And we'll give, now this is our sampling rate. We're going to sample in at CD quality sampling rate, 44.1. The sampling rates are adjustable all the way up to DAT quality, which is 48,000 samples per second. You can bring that way down if you're recording something like explosions or something that doesn't need to be high quality. We're going to be recording vocals, music, and the like, and so I'm just going to keep this at 44.1 and record in at CD quality. We have to decide where we're going to put the sample, and I'm going to open up our sample list now. The sample list is a list of drawers that you decide on to record samples to. I have opened up three different drawers. I know for the soundtrack we'll be making, I'll be recording music, vocal, and special effects. So I've named each of these appropriately, music, vocal, and special effects. I'm going to move this out of the way so we can see our record window. And this X here indicates which of the different drawers we have as the record path for Studio 16. I'm going to play the DAT tape now so we can hear our first sample. Those three dragons, they're okay, getting close. Okay, we can hear this is going to be a vocal sample. Close. So, it's going to go to the vocal pathway right here. Uh, let's open up our mixer so we can adjust the volume. Here's our Studio 16 mixer. Within the mixer, you can choose different channels to mediate. Right now we have the input channel up and the output channel up, and that's all we need for right now. Let's also open up a Studio 16 meter window so that we can more clearly see the volume that's coming into Studio 16 to which we'll be recording. So again, we have different channels on the meter, and I'm going to get rid of some of them so that all we have are input and output matching our mixer input and output. There are three different parts to the Studio 16 meters. Right now, I'm just showing the digital waveform graph meter. We can also bring up a digital LED meter, 
and an analog meter. So I'll bring those three up. So now we have all three meters. We have our mixer window open, our recorder window open, and we have our sample list open and our path chosen. Now one other thing I need to do is choose an input for the recorder. So if I go up to my recorder window, I can see that I can choose input left, input right. You can also record output, output right or output left. I need to record input right because I already know the sample is on the right channel of the DAT. So now I will rewind the tape and play it again. And get ready to hit my record button. They fought against the evils Just of a certain criminal element up. known as the stingers. Cobra Khan is the last of the true stingers. But he is training new members in his evil and corruption. <laughs> so I've clicked on record. Those three dragons, they're getting close. Much too close. There's our sample. Think you can click on stop. Out of this and I'll click on the monitor man. to turn it off so that we don't hear the rest of the tape. And now I'll stop the DAT tape. Okay, here's our sample, those three dragons. And it shows it was recorded on the right channel. And we can play that right now just by clicking on it and hitting the hot key from the keyboard, Amiga P. <laughs> those three dragons are getting close, much too close. Okay, so we have our sample, but we also have some extraneous material at the beginning of our sample. And we can get rid of that by bringing the sample into the editor. So the sample's been selected, and I'll open Studio 16's editor. So what we're looking at now is a waveform graph of the sample we just recorded. I can select the entire thing and play it. Those three dragons are getting close, much too close. And you can see that with a waveform editor, it's very easy to see the audio that we want to keep and the audio that we want to get rid of. So to get rid of the audio we don't want, we just highlight it. And from the editor menu, we select Cut. And it's gone. We also have some silence at the end of the audio right here. And we can cut that away, too. And now, when we select the entire piece and play it, those three dragons are getting close, much too close. All we have is exactly the audio sample we want. Now, these edits that I've made, the cuts from the beginning and the end, were non-destructive, which means that I can get all of that back by just coming down to this function right here and doing undo all. So now the sample is exactly as it was originally recorded on the hard drive. We have the entire sample up here. Those three dragons are getting close, much too close. So anytime you make a mistake, all you have to do is undo. We didn't make a mistake, so I'm going to again cut the front and cut the back. And now what I want to do is make this permanent. We've decided that this is the sample we want. So I'm going to come down and do a make permanent. Once you do a make permanent, you cannot do an undo. But we know this is what we want, so I'm going to do a make permanent. Studio 16 asks you if you're sure you want to do this, because this will affect the actual sample recorded on the hard drive. And we know this is what we want to do, so I'm clicking OK. And there's our permanent sample. I'll again select the entire thing and play it. Those three dragons are getting close, much too close. OK, so that's exactly what we want. I'm going to go ahead and close the editor window now. So now we have our first sample in our sample list, and we can just move on from here. So I'll just play the DAT tape again, and we'll record the next sample in. OK, let's turn on the monitor so we're sure we the can hear it. dragons are getting close, and much too close. Record. Think you can dance your way out of this one, mess man? Okay, there's our second sample. And it's appeared in the sample list as untitled because we didn't name it. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it, and we can now name it after the fact in the sample list menu by choosing Rename Sample. And I believe the first words were Think You Can Dance. So we'll go ahead and type that right in here as the name of the sample.
And there we have Think You Can Dance. We'll go ahead and click on it and play it to make sure we have it right. Play sample. Think you can dance your way out of this one, masked man? That one sounds pretty good to me. I don't think we need to trim that one. I also have quite a few samples that have already pre-recorded into Studio 16, which we'll be using for this soundtrack. They're in another drawer of another sample list, so I'll go ahead and show you how to open that up. All we need to do is go to our sample list menu and add a new path. The new path will be this one right here. So I've just chosen it and I'm clicking OK. And these are the other samples that we'll be using for this soundtrack. Uh, to move them over into the drawers we have here, all we have to do is click on them and drag them over into the appropriate drawer. Sound effects for the hits, uh, vocals for vocals here. So you get the idea of how to move samples from one path to another. Now I'm going to show you how to arrange samples in a cue list. To do that, I'm going to use a sample list that I've already set up. And here's the sample list I've already set up with the three different drawers, sound effects, music, and vocals. In the interest of neatness, I'm going to close these other windows because we're done with them now. And now I'll open up our cue list. From the Applications menu, just choose Cue List. And here's an empty cue list. We have four tracks being displayed, all audio tracks. To bring a sample into the cue list, we simply choose a sample and drag it and drop it onto the track we want to drop it on. So you can put it on any track and you can move it around with the mouse. Just drag it between track to track or up and down. When I'm moving this up and down, you notice that at the bottom of the screen are empty time code numbers. So what we have is a visual representation of a empty time code timeline. As the sample moves, you'll see the start time represented here change. So that's how you know when the sample is going to be triggered according to empty time code. Okay, now that we have the sample in the cue list, I'm going to show you how to manipulate it. Uh, we can play this by turning the cue list on, grabbing our play flag, bringing it just before the sample, and you'll see that there's a empty start time for the play flag as well. So that's where the play flag is. Here's the start time for the sample. When the play flag reaches this start time, right here, the sample will play. So I'll just click on play. This is just like the buttons that you'll see on any tape deck. So it's very familiar, very intuitive. Click on play. And there's our sample. It's an explosion. I'll go ahead and click on stop, and you can see that the line stops moving. I can take this sample and duplicate it out by holding down the control key, clicking on the sample, and dragging out another one. We now have two representations of the same sample. I can drag the play flag back and play from here again by clicking on play. So it's the same sample being played twice, because I just dragged out another one. I can take these two samples and join them. Uh, I'm going to use what we call our butt joining function. So if I click here, when I slide the samples into each other, they butt up against each other and join. Now when I play them both together, you'll hear one start right after the other one ends. You can also perform crossfades by clicking on this button here. So I'll pull the samples apart and crossfade them into each other. Now rather than continually dragging the play flag back to the start, there are a number of things I can do. This is our reset play flag. So if I set this marker anywhere and then click on the reset play button, the play flag will jump to this marker and begin to play. So I've set it before our samples, and I'll click on the reset play button, and you can see the play flag moved and is now playing. So there's our crossfade. In effect, 
What we've done here is lengthened the effect of the explosion. I'll go ahead and play it again so you can hear that. So it's lengthened and it almost sounds as if there was an echo effect, as if it happened in a canyon or something. So here's a way that you can use the functions of Studio 16 to actually create new sound effects. Now let's say that we like this new sound effect and we want to record this and actually make a duplicate of the way they sound together as one. Well, there's a recording function in Studio 16 in the cue list. This is a punch out flag and we'll set that at the back. This is a record punch in flag. So we can set them on either side of these two samples that we've joined and anything that's between these two samples, between these two flags, will be recorded. We now need to select a track to record to. By doing that, all we have to do is click right here, and that selects this track. Now we have to select what we're going to record. If I click on these samples, an event parameters window comes up. This tells me that the sample is panned full left. It's at zero dB volume. It tells me when it starts, when it ends, what kind of crossfade it has. The most important information for me right now is where it's panned. It's panned full left, so I can click OK here. I know that on this track, what I need to do is record output left, because the sample is panned full left. Here I can give my new sample a name. We'll call this explosion. And again, we need to choose a path in the sample list to record to. It's a sound effect, so I'm going to record to the sound effect track. We can now close this window here and turn on the record button, just like any tape deck. You have your play, stop, fast forward, rewind, and your record button. Clicking record, this track becomes highlighted, indicating this is where it will record. You can see that this is shaded in between the two record flags. That is the exact place where it will record. Now I'll click on my reset play button again. The play flag will jump back to the reset marker and play. When it gets to the punch in flag, it will start to record these samples into this track. When it gets to the punch out flag, it'll stop recording. And now I'll click stop, turn record off, and there's our new sample. There it is in the cue list, and here it is in our sample list. Now that I have our new sample, uh, we can go ahead and play it by double clicking on it, bringing up the event parameters window again, clicking on play. It came out great. Now that I have this new sample, I don't need these other samples anymore. I can just click on them and they become highlighted and I just hit the delete key on the keyboard. Again, it's very intuitive. Click on it and delete. The sample goes away. It's no longer in the cue list. It's still in the sample list. It's still right there, still recorded on the hard drive. It's just no longer in the cue list. Now that I'm done recording, I can also get my punch in and punch out flags back out of the way. Uh, to show you some further functions in the cue list, I'm going to bring up left and right music samples. I'm done with this sample, so I'll delete it. And I'll just drag up my left and right music samples from the sample list into the cue list. Now you can see that these are quite a bit bigger than the other sample. I'll bring up the other sample again. So the amount of space here, the size of the block, is representative of the amount of empty time it takes up, the length of the sample. So this explosion is very short, whereas these music samples are very long. I can see the entirety of the music samples by zooming out on the cue list. You can see the amount of the cue list that's represented by the size of this little slider right here. So on the keyboard, the up and down arrows zoom in and zoom out. So I'll just click on the up arrow and zoom out. You can see we're seeing more and more of the cue list here. And the size representation of the cue list is also getting larger here. So at a certain point, we can see the entirety of these two samples. I'll go ahead and delete the explosion from the cue list again. So here's our two music samples. We have a problem. 
their stereo left and right. We need to synchronize them exactly, frame accurately, so there will be no phasing between the left and right stereo. To do that, I'm going to zoom in again on the area at the front of the samples. To get them into the center of my screen here, I can just move the slider back and forth until I get them right in the center. Now you'll see these vertical grid lines here. These lines you can set yourself. Right now, if I look in the QList Options menu under Grid Spacing, we can see that they're set to every second. You can set them to every NTSC second, every frame, every minute, every 10 minutes, or you can custom size it. You can set it to whatever you want. You can set it to every two frames if you want. Right now, I like the way it's set. It's set to every second. I'm going to click this closed and accept that. So we have vertical grid lines that show me where the samples start in SEMPTI time code. We also have a start time up here for each sample. And I could click on the sample and drag them back and forth until I get the same sample start time here. But there's a faster way. Right now, I'm able to move samples infinitely between tracks, up and down SEMPTI time code. If I click on this button, the samples will now snap to the grid lines as I move them. So you can see this sample snaps to the grid line as I move it. If I snap each sample to the same grid line, I, now I know they start exactly at the same time. But this may not be where we want these samples to start. Although they're synchronized, we may want to move them. So in order to move them together now that they're synchronized, I'll hold down the Shift key, click on the unhighlighted sample so that they both become highlighted, hold down the right mouse button, and from our entry menu, I will choose Group. Now the samples are grouped. If I click on this gadget so that I can move them infinitely anywhere again, the samples are now together. No matter where I move them, up and down SEMPTI time code, or in between tracks, the samples always move together. They always stay synchronized as stereo samples. So now that we have our stereo samples synchronized in the cue list, something you might want to do since they're music samples is fade them in. This is very easily done in Studio 16. You notice there are two buttons here. The middle button is for cropping. So if we drag this back, we crop the sample shorter. The button on top is for fading in. So if we grab the top button and pull it back, we have a diagonal fade. So the sample fades right in. If I zoom in on this sample, we can do this a little bit more easily. You can see it clearer. So I'm grabbing the top square and the bottom sample, and I'm dragging that in. So now these samples will fade in. I'll click on Play. Uh, let's try that again. I'll come right from the Reset Play flag. I'll zoom out so we can see it happen. So it's a nice, smooth fade into the samples. Uh, we'll probably also want to fade them out, so I'll go right to the end of the samples. There they are. And grab the top square again, and just pull them right out. And now what I'll do is move my reset play flag to the end so we can audition the end of this to listen to the fades. Click on reset play. Let's give it a little bit more pre-roll time. So it's a nice, smooth fade out. We may want to fade it differently. Right now, I have diagonal fades. Within Studio 16, there are three different kinds of fades that you can do. The straight diagonal fade, a curve up or a curve down. To get one of the other fades, we'll double click on the sample. And then we can choose from here what shape we want it to be. If I drag this down, you can actually see the shape change. So here's our diagonal fade, our diagonal fade. There's our curve up and are curved down. You can change this for each individual sample. So I can have one sample curved down, and I can have the other sample curve up. So there are a lot of different ways that you can modify the sounds once you get them into the cue list. And again, these changes are non-destructive. If I don't like what I've done here, I can grab this and just drag it back out. And now the sample ends cold. Or I can change it. I can drag it way in. So these sample 
fade outs and fade ins are infinitely variable. Okay, now that we've seen how to manipulate the samples in the cue list, let's prepare the tape for synchronization of the cue list with the videotape. The first thing we need to do is stripe empty time code on the videotape. To do this, I'm going to use a different utility program offered by Sunrise Industries called Sempty Out. Here's our Sempty Output window. Sempty Output will stripe audio time code, Sempty LTC, from the Amiga's audio ports to the audio input of any video deck. Now we can reset this time code to anything we want. Uh, if I want to start this, let's say, at an hour, we'll start the Sempty time code running at one hour. All we have to do is click in there and it's automatically entered. Now what I'm going to do is do an audio dub onto my original master tape so that my original master tape that has no audio on it will be striped with Sempty time code for me to align with Studio 16. So I'll click on play to start the Sempty time code out of the Amiga's audio ports. We see that the Sempty time code is running and now we'll do our audio dub on our SVHS deck. You can see the pre-roll is happening here and the audio dub is about to begin. So this can be used with any deck that has an audio dub feature. If you have decks that already have Sempty timecode LTC built in, you don't need to do this feature, this function here. You can already go into the next step of arranging your Sempty timecode, arranging your samples according to Sempty timecode in the queue list. But since we are working with decks that don't have that function, I'm striping the Sempty timecode onto the audio tracks of this deck across the entirety of the video, the piece we want to edit to. So it's about 50 seconds long. And of course, there's nothing on the screen here. So what we'll do after we get done in order to see what Sempty timecode each frame is at is we will stripe a Sempty timecode window burn over a copy of the original video. And we'll do that after we get done striping the Sempty timecode on the audio track. And we're almost done here. This is the end of the video track. And we'll let it run on a little bit longer so that we can have some time to trail out music or whatever sound effects we want to do. OK, that should be good enough. I'll go ahead and stop my deck from recording. And I'll stop my Sempty time code from running and close that out. And now we'll run Studio 16 again. And we'll take the audio from this deck and put it into Studio 16's Sempty input. And we should be able to read the Sempty time code on that tape with Studio 16's Sempty monitor, which is right here. I'm going to go ahead and close our cue list since we don't need it anymore. Here's our Sempty monitor window. And now if I rewind my tape and play it back, we should be able to see Studio 16 reading the Sempty time code that we just striped on the audio channels right here in this window. So my deck is playing back. And as you can see in Studio 16 here, we're reading Sempty time code coming from the audio channel on the videotape in this deck. And this is striped all throughout the entire video that we'll be syncing to. So now the next step is to take this information and do what we call a Sempty time code window burn and actually put this information over a copy of the videotape so that we can see as each frame of the videotape goes by exactly what Sempty time code is attached to that frame. So to do that, I'm going to close my sample list window. I'm going to raise this Sempty monitor window up to the top of the screen. I will stop my tape right now. And I'm just getting this screen set up to do the Sempty time code window burn. I'm going to go into the preferences and select a different color scheme for the screen to make this a little bit simpler. Now we have a higher contrast between the numbers and what will be the background of the video. Studio 16's Sempty monitor has a function called hide title bar. When I click on this, everything goes away but the Sempty window. This is what we'll be gen locking over the video as we make a copy of the video. 
So now we'll get out of Studio 16 and run our toaster, which is what we'll be using for our Genlock, and then we'll quit the toaster and we'll have this Genlocked over our video. Okay, here's our video toaster. I'm running the toaster right now so that we can genlock that empty time code window we just saw over the video. So we're going to run our video source through the toaster after it's been turned off. We're still running it through the hardware. When you run the toaster and then turn it off, the genlock is activated and whatever's on the Amiga screen is put over the video. Since I changed the screen to black on the video on the Amiga, it's going to be very easy to see that empty time code window over the video and the video will show through the black part of the Amiga screen once we run the toaster and shut it off to run the genlock on the toaster. Okay, my source deck is coming in through input 2 of the toaster, so I'm selecting input 2 so that when I shut the toaster off and run the genlock function, the video will be coming up because it's on source 2. So I'm going to go into setup now and quit. Shut down the video toaster, yes. So here we are back to our workbench and now I need to find my Studio 16 screen. There we go. So we'll do the hide the title bar function. And there we go. This is what we'll genlock over our video. So now what we'll do is take our tape out of our record deck and put it into our source deck. This is the tape that has the empty time code striped on the audio channels. I'm going to take a blank tape, put it into our record deck, and I'll pl plus press play on our source deck and play record on our record deck. And now what's happening is empty time code is being fed from our source deck to our record deck. Video is also being fed from our source deck through the toaster, through the genlock in the toaster, genlocking this empty time code window over the video that we had on our edited video master. So now when this is all done, what we'll have is the edited video master copy with this empty time code window burned in over it. So as we flip through this video, looking for points to synchronize sound, we'll be able to use this empty time code window to exactly frame accurately match up the audio to the video. We'll be able to get it so accurate that we can do lip syncs and, and you won't even notice it. Gunshots, doors closing, footsteps, everything will be absolutely frame accurate. And it's very easy to do. This can be done with any deck, any two decks. Uh, one of them has to have an audio dub feature to stripe the empty time code and you have to have a gen lock in order to get this window in Studio 16 on top of your video. So we'll be working with a copy of the video. And this is important. You don't want to work with your original because uh, you can wear it out. So we're working with a copy. And it looks like it's done here. So I'm going to press stop on both of my decks. And I'll rewind them both. And now we'll play back the video that will have the Sempty time code window burn on it and the Sempty time code on the audio channels. So this is the tape that we just made. So you can see it running here in your monitor and we can see that right here in Studio 16 the Sempty time code window, Sempty time code monitor is picking up the time code from that videotape. So this is great. We're all we're all ready to go here. We're set to go with this. So I'm going to stop it and rewind it. And now I'll reset Studio 16 and get it set up for the audio editing. I'm going to reset the preferences so we get our colors back to normal. There we go. And we'll resize this down a little bit. And let's get our cue list up so we can start putting our samples in. And we'll open up our samples so that we can start putting them in the cue list. Okay, let's bring these down. Okay, now what we need to do is make sure that our cue list is within the range of this empty time code. If we look down here, we can see the cue list starts at zero hours, uh, two minutes, eight seconds, 26 frames. If we go to the end, 
Uh, so we're not within the range yet. So I'm going to go to the options, Qlist preferences, and set it up. We'll set the SEMPTI start time here to be one hour. Exactly. And we'll set the end time to be one hour. And uh, let's make it one hour, five minutes. Zero, zero, zero. Okay, so now we have a cue list that will go from one hour exactly to one hour and five minutes. That should encompass our SEMPTI time code on the videotape. So that's what we have here now. You'll see this goes all the way the end here, one hour, five minutes, and the beginning is right at one hour. So now we need to play the tape and find out where exactly we need to drop our samples. I'm going to rename these tracks to make it easier for me to keep track of my samples. Right now they all say audio. You can name them whatever you want just by clicking on them and then renaming them. I'm going to name the top one sound effects. We'll just call it SFX. Hit return. It's SFX. This one will be uh, narration. And this one will be dialogue. Okay. And this one will be music right and we've run out of tracks we need another track for our left track of music so I'm going to click on this arrow whenever you click on this arrow here in a track what that means is that this is the track that something's going to happen to you remember that when I did the record I clicked on this arrow when I clicked on record this track became highlighted when the cue list is on in between these two flags we're not going to record what we are going to do is add another track. And since I've clicked here, the next track that comes in is going to be coming in right below this arrow. So I go up to track, and I want to add another audio track. Boom, and there it is. So now we, we have five tracks up here. I'm going to get rid of that arrow, and I'll name this track Music Left. So we have our five tracks set up, our sound effects track, narration, dialogue, music right, music left. I am now going to select one track. I'll select the first one, sound effects. I'm going to run the tape through and watch it. And as it runs through, whenever there's something that needs a sound effect, an explosion, whatever, I'm going to hit a hot key on the keyboard that will be Amiga T. What will happen when I do that is a sample will be dropped in to the cue list right at that SEMPTI time code, and I'll know that a sound effect sample belongs there. So I'm going to get ready to hit my Amiga T. I've got my track indicated, and my tape is rewound, and I'll just hit play. Studio 16 is reading the time code in the SEMPTI monitor. I need to make sure that the cue list is on and selected. And now I'm waiting for the first visual. There it is. And I hit Amiga T, and you can see the empty sample right here waiting for a sound effect to be dropped in. So now I'm looking for the next sound effect cue, and there it is, the explosion. And then there's our next sample. So now I'm just taking visual cues from the screen. I think I missed a kick there somewhere. We're just watching. There's another explosion. You'll see the samples. The empty samples keep dropping in on that track. There's a police car siren. These are all dialogue samples that need to be placed here, and all I'm doing is sound effects right now. So we're waiting, and there we go. There's a couple quick ones. This is all going to be dialogue, and there's some more sound effects. Okay, so let's stop our tape and rewind it and take a look at the track that we just filled up with empty samples here. So it's our SFX track, our sound effects track, and it's all full of these boxes that we have to fill in with real samples. Uh, let's go ahead now and play forward, forward the tape and find out where that first sample is on the tape and see what it is and decide what we want to put in that spot. 
So I'm fast forwarding. Okay, our first sample is going to come up right with the title. And what we could do is something like uh, put in a kick. We'll go up to our sample list, and here's a kick. We'll go ahead and play it to see what it sounds like. Okay, so we can drop that in. The way we're going to drop that into this empty sample is by double-clicking on the sample and bringing up the event parameters window again. You can see that this is empty. There's no name here in the sample, the sample name window. I'm just going to drag it from our sample list, drop it in, and boom. There it is. It's really small. Let me bring the play flag over and we'll zoom in on it. Okay, there's our kick. And it's at zero dB. It's panned to the center. We can adjust the pan to the left, to the right, anything we want while we're in this window. Let me go ahead and close that. We'll leave it panned to the center. And now let's forward our tape here and go to the next section. We'll find the next sample that we need. Just going to play and watching for the visual again and watching here. Okay, and that is where the line comes into our box, and it's this explosion. So we have a couple of explosions that we recorded in off the DAT, and we'll go ahead and audition those. There's one. That's the one that we edited earlier in the cue list. And here's a third one. Okay, I think this one is the one that belongs in this particular spot. So I'm going to go to my cue list, double click on this box. Here's this empty start time for the sample. This is the time that it's reserving for the sample. There's nothing here. Just drag it from the cue list and put it in. And now let's rewind the tape and see how those samples come in when we play the tape back with this empty time code. And we'll see how they're triggered. The first one should come up approximately where the titles come up. Okay, Maybe a little late. We can adjust that very easily. The second one should come up right as that explosion hits. That was pretty good. Okay, we want to move the first one up. So we're going to go and adjust that first sample. There it is. Let's go with our deck now to the exact frame where the title bar first comes up. Rewinding the deck, and here's our title slate, our title page. And I'm just fast forwarding. We can see the empty time code numbers move on the monitor. Back up, and right there. That's where it comes in. So one hour, 25 seconds, and two frames. We want to get this right exactly as it comes up. So I could drag this to one hour, 25 minutes, and two frames. But since we have this empty time code number on our screen and we know what it is, I can just double click on this, come up to our empty start time window, and enter one hour, 25 seconds, and two frames. Hit return, and you can see the sample move right to that time. So now we'll go back and play this again. This time when we play the tape, the kick sound effect should come up right as that first frame of our title page comes up. There it is, exactly. That was great. Now let's go to the next sound effect, which is that explosion, there it is right there. And we want to get this one right on. So that's where it just starts. Let's go ahead and put it right in there. One hour, 39 seconds, 19 frames. Bang, just like that. Quick, it's easy, it's exactly frame accurate. So we'll go ahead and play the tape. And when that bomb explodes, the sound effect in Studio 16 will go off exactly right. And here it comes. Sounds great. You can never tell that it wasn't recorded at the scene and on the original footage. You can't tell that it was removed, put on DAT, later recorded and rearranged back onto the tape. 
So I'm going to stop this and we'll go through our tracks in this manner and we'll trigger sound effects, these uh, time code reservations for each part of the dialogue, each part of the narration, and where we want the music to start. Let's do dialogue next. Dialogue is very interesting because we're going to have to actually lip sync these samples. So there's no way that you can fudge and say, well, that kind of looks all right. This has got to be exactly right on. So I'm selecting my dialogue track. And again, I'm rewinding the tape, and we're going to play it through and watch for the pieces of dialogue that have to be dropped in as the tape rolls. And I'm going to hit the Amiga T to drop those in. Here we go. There's one. There's another. There's a third. There's another one. OK, let's go ahead and stop there and just concentrate on these first dialogue samples that we've got and see how we're going to drop them in and match them up frame accurately to lip sync. The first thing I'm going to want to do, since we have another track with sound effect samples on it, is solo this track, this dialogue track. So now all we'll hear are the dialogue samples. Because if we have everything on and we're hearing everything, it gets distracting. So now we can just concentrate on this dialogue track. Let's go ahead and rewind the tape and play it forward and take a look at the part we're going to work on. Okay, here's our first dialogue sample. Okay, he's speaking. I know from watching the raw footage before it was edited that this guy is saying those three dragons are getting too close. And here's that sample in the sample list. Those three dragons are getting close, much too close. Okay, and so this is at about 133.19. So this sample is just about right. I'm going to open it up, and in the event parameters window, drop in those three dragons. Check the volume, it's 0 dB. We'll leave it pan center. And now we'll rewind the tape and play it through and see, if, see how close that sample is matched to lips. It won't be right on because we were just doing an approximate, taking a visual cue and hitting the time code add. But let's take a look. Those three dragons are getting close, much too close. Wow. OK, so that's way off. It looks like what's happening is the sample actually starts before he comes on screen. So this is a difficult problem here. We have to frame accurately synchronize this sample to his lips moving before we can actually see them. We're going to cheat. I'm going to rewind the tape back to where he just stops talking. So we'll go back and we'll find out where his lips stop moving. Here he goes. He's talking, advancing forward. Bam, right about there, 135.16. This is going to be the end of the sample. So now I can double click on the sample, and just like I entered the start time, I can enter the end time. So 135.16. And hit return. And now you can see it's no longer overlapping this other sample. So now we'll play it through and see how close we got. You can see it's going to start way before he gets on Those screen. Those three dragons are getting close, much too close. It's a little bit off. Let's listen to it one more time. And it needs to be moved a few frames. Those three dragons are getting close, much too close. Uh, sounds like it's a little bit fast, maybe. So if we click on it, we see this is the start time. Let's move it forward maybe two frames to 131.12. Let's try it again. So this is about as tough a situation as you'll ever find. Something that's got to be synced before it, you actually see it happen. Those three dragons are getting close, much too close. Now it looks a little bit early now. Let's take it back. Stop the tape, and maybe it was actually early before. So I've moved it back, and we're going to play it forward again. Those three dragons are getting close, 
Much too close. All right, there it is. Perfectly lip synced. Something that wasn't even on the screen. And we'll go back to the second sample. It's going to happen right when this gentleman here starts speaking. He's going to be difficult too because his mouth is very tight when it's moving. But you can see it open just as his arm swings over. There it's open and there it's closed. So let's say that it should be right in there somewhere. 136.11. Let's see where this is. 136.29. So it is quite a few frames late. He is right here. Again, you get your audio cues, you know, from watching the raw footage, who's saying what and what voices are which. So I've dropped him in here, and let's rewind him and see how he does. Getting close, much too close. Think you can dance your way out of wow. this one, masked man? So the sample's way late. Again, it's very difficult to match his lips with a frame to see what he's saying because of the way he moves his mouth. So I'm just going to scoot it forward with the mouse a few frames. Starts at 136.29. I'll move it up to 136.26. And this is actually fairly quick with just a few tries back and forth. Getting close. We can get it Much too close. matched up. Think you can dance your way out of this one mess, Still man? too late. 139.26, move it up to 139.20. Let's see where that gets us. They're getting close. Much too close. Think you can dance your way out of this one, masked man? That's pretty close. Maybe one frame early. So we can even move this one frame. Just drag it back, just one frame late. Right there. Play it through one last time, just to make sure. Much too close. Think you can dance your way out of this one, masked man? Oh, we were right before, so it has to go one, one more frame forward. And there it is. Now let's get to the next one. He's going to be kind of difficult, too. But let's open this up and drop this sample in. And let's see how close it is. This one messed man. Let the game wow. begin. So it's way late. So my reaction time in dropping these in was a little slow. I'm just going to drag it forward, just kind of feel it. Drag it by feel. Games begin. Think you can dance your way out of this one, masked man? Let the games begin. Okay, that one was a little off. Let's work on dialing that one in a little closer. I think it might be a little bit late. I'm going to move it up forward just a couple frames, play back the tape. Think you can dance your way out of this one, masked man? Let the games begin. Well, there it is. It's exactly frame accurately locked up. Okay, let's go ahead and do this one here. So you can see how easy it is to lock these samples up and lip sync them to the video. We can go right to that frame, especially using this empty time code window burn. Here's another one, another situation where he starts speaking before he's on film. So when we cut to him, when we actually get him on the screen, his mouth's already open, he's already speaking. So I'm going to show you another trick to line this up. From seeing the, the raw footage, I know that he is saying, I've played this game before, this sample right here. 
Let me see how closely it's lined up to begin with. Rewind and play forward. I played this game before. Okay, so it's way off. Because we can't get right on the beginning, because he's not on the screen when he starts talking, I'm going to use another trick. The letter P is a very distinctive letter. When you say the letter P, your lips come together. P I've played this game before. So I'm going to go through here. And his mouth is open. Oh, we got to go back frame by frame. Bum, bum. So I've... So right there. That's where he starts saying played. So here's our sample. The way I'm going to figure out where the sample starts to say played is by using the crop function. Right now, if we open up the event parameters window and play the sample, it plays the whole thing. I played this game before. Now we can take the crop function and just grab right there and move it back. I played this game before. So we cut off the beginning, and what we want is right where it says played. I played this game before. I'm going to zoom in on our cue list so that we can move it with the mouse easier. You can see our map our mouse movements and move it back just a little bit I want all of played I played this game before that's pretty close so now what we have is half a sample there okay we've got this cropped just where we want it now now we just need to align it with the frame on the video monitor so we have one hour 49 seconds four frames so now the empty start time doesn't refer to the beginning of the sample which you can actually see represented by this dotted line here this, this is the new empty start time right there. So let's move this to 1 hour 49 seconds and 4 frames. And it's right there. Now when we play back the video, it should be really close. Of course, we'll only have half of the sample. I played this game before. There it is. It's beautiful. So now how do we get the rest of the sample in? That's the next question. Well, I'm going to go back to, to our partial sample, zoom out a little bit so that we can see what we're doing. And you'll remember before when we were working with the explosion sample, we held down the control key, clicked on the sample, and dragged out a new one. And now what we have are two copies of the exact same sample. This one, what I'm going to do is line it up with the first sample by just getting the end time. Or the, be or the start time. I'm going to use the end time because I'm going to be changing the beginning times. So let's get this up here again. And it's going to be 1 hour 50, 19. So we'll just set this one, 1 hour 50, 19. Oh, OK, it's right on. And now to keep from moving the sample, now that it's synchronized in time the way I want it, what I will do is click on this button here. This button will only allow me to move samples up and down between tracks. So now. I can't drag this sample forward or backward. It won't come out of sync. I can drag this crop out and then crop it from the back all the way forward. And I want the end time of this sample now to be exactly the same as the beginning time of this sample. Beginning time of this sample, 1 hour 49, 4 frames. This needs to be 1 hour 49, 4 frames. There it is. So since this track is soloed, I won't hear this track but I can solo them both. So now I'm going to hear these two tracks, but I won't hear any of the other tracks. Let me just make sure I've got this cut right by playing the tape back. And here we go. I played this game before. It's beautiful. So it's completely locked up, but we want to get that sample out of this track because this is reserved for our music. So we'll go ahead and take the solo off of that, put it back on here. And again, we have this function on, so I can only move this up and down. What will happen when I move it up is it will become mixed in with the other sample. It's just crossfaded right into the other sample. So now when I play them back, the two copies of, this, of that one sample will be meshed together, and they'll both be frame accurately lip synced to the, the voice on the screen. Games begin.
I played this game before. There it is. Very simple, very quick. There's some little tricks that you can use with the functions in Studio 16 to lock them up, even if the person is not on the screen when they first start talking. Okay, now we'll go ahead and put the music in. We'll drop that into left and right here. I'm going to zoom all the way out so I can see the entire span of the cue list. Okay, so there's our whole cue list. We can see this is our first sound effect, which happens when the slate comes up. And these are our last sound effects that happen as he's punching the punching bag. So I'm going to grab my music track left and drop it into music track left. And we'll click on this function so that I can adjust it in Sempty time code, just roughly. And then we'll get music track right and drop it in. Oops. And we'll go ahead and zoom in on the start of those. Just like we did with the previous samples, we're going to synchronize these stereo music samples. There they are right there. I'll use the grid lock function again. We'll snap these right to the grid. Shift click to highlight them both. Group them. And now we'll be able to move them together. Okay, now we want this music to start basically right when the first slate comes up. So we want that kick out in the clear, and then we want music to start. I'm going to bring this up a little bit. We'll move these back. These are long samples. OK, so here we are. Now we need to align these, so I'll zoom in on this area. We'll get the start time of this, ten, 1 hour, 25 seconds, 2 frames. And we'll just enter that in there. Actually, let's drag them both together so they move together. 25 and 2. So now what will happen is we'll get the kick, and the music will start at the same time. So I'm going to turn off the solo so we can hear all the tracks, rewind the tape all the way back to the beginning, to the beginning and play it through. So we'll hear how the beginning sounds. We'll get that kick and the music. That's pretty good. It came out pretty good. I think what I'm going to do with the music is change it a little bit. I want to fade these in. And we'll use this curved upward fade here. And just fade it in right under the kick. So that the kick is almost entirely out in the clear. And we'll play it again. I think that sounds pretty good. So now the music tracks will go on. Those three dragons are getting close, much too close. Think you can dance your way out of this one, masked man? So you can the see as you layer the sounds, begin. how this really starts to come to life, how it really becomes a, a top-notch production. I played this game before. Everything frame accurately linked. Go ahead and stop the tape. Now that we've seen how easy it is to frame accurately lay in sound effects like explosions and uh, sirens for police cars, and we've seen how easy it is to lip sync dialogue, even if the actor is speaking before they get on screen, I'm going to go to a cue list that I've already finished for this soundtrack so that we can see how we can layer the sound properly in Studio 16's mixer. So I'll bring up a new cue list. I'm going to open, uh, I've called it Ninja Q. I I think it's self-explanatory. OK, and here's our sound effects and dialogue and music for the entire soundtrack. So I've already made this up. We're going to go into Studio 16's mixer and really explore how to use it to its fullest advantage. I'm going to open up more channels. I have five different tracks that I'm using here. So I'm going to open up, play one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, we won't need the input mixer up. And let's just set output down to 0 dB. And then we can go ahead and close it off. OK. And we'll get rid of output. So what we have here are our five 
mixers corresponding to five different tracks. Now these are assignable, so I can go into the SFX track and tell it to play back on track one, on pot one, play one, play two. So now the narration will be play two. And I'm doing this so I'll know exactly where the tracks are coming up on which pots. Playback four. And finally, music left will be playback five. Now, playback four and playback five should be locked together because they're stereo music samples and they should go up and down in volume at the same time. To lock these two together, I'm going to use Studio 16's lock function. I click on one and it becomes highlighted. Now, all I have to do is click on the other pot that I want locked to that until it's highlighted the same color. And there it is green. Uh, we have narration and dialogue. What I probably want to do is on our narration track, which is kind of quiet, track number two, I will inversely lock that to the music tracks so that when narration actually happens, I can bring the music down, the dialogue volume will go up. So they're inversely locked here. Our stereo music samples are locked together, and the music and narration are inversely locked. So this will help us in mixing down this cue list. The first thing I want to do is make sure the cue list is not on use mixer levels, because I want to use the levels that I set in the cue list. You remember when we double click on these, you can set the level. So I want to take these levels as a base. So within my mixer menu, I'm going to record the volume and record the pan information, both. I'm going to turn off playback volume and playback pan because those are for use when you're using mixer levels. So right now I'm going to play the cue list through, record the volumes that are there into the mixer using record volume and record pan. So we'll go back to the beginning. I'll rewind the tape. And we'll be able to listen to the entire thing now, and you'll be able to see all of the sound effects frame accurately matched with the video. And you'll see the mixer pots and pans moving to correspond to the different tracks. You can see here we have information left and right. Those music three samples. dragons are getting close, much too close. Here's our dialogue. I think you can dance your way out of this one, mess man. Let Here's the our games sound effects. Begin. You can see how the pan information I've played changes. this game before. This is far too dangerous. Starring the maniac cop. It's a narration. Robert Sadar. I swear I will take revenge! Gary Daniels as the White Dragon. From Bruce Lee's Game of Death, Mel Novak. I'm only giving you the business out of respect to your father. And introducing Joseph Valencia. Okay, and that's the whole movie trailer. So within Studio 16, in a very short time, we've created this entire five-track movie trailer. Now we've recorded the volume levels in the cue list into the mixer. So now what I want to do is, in the cue list options menu, turn on use mixer levels. So now it's checked, which means that now the mixer is controlling the volume and pans, not the actual information of the individual samples. Also, in the mixer menu, I want to turn playback volume and playback pan both on. I'm going to take a section on this track. I'm going to solo this track. And these two samples are the samples I'm going to play with. I'm going to take our play flag. Well, let's use our reset play flag. And listen to him play once. Starring the maniac cop, Robert Zadar. He said they're both pan sender. It's OK. We can make this more interesting by panning one all the way left, and as he speaks, pan it all the way to the right. So instead of having this pan to the center, what I'm going to do is hit reset play and grab the pan information in this pot and pan it from left to right as he speaks. Starring the maniac cop, Robert Zadar. And now we'll play that back, and you'll see the pot, the pan mixer, 
go back and forth as this plays. Starring the maniac cop, Robert Zadar. And you can hear the stereo effect that has. Gary Dent. You can Dent. individually adjust each one of your samples, every single part of the cue list, and the mixer will memorize it. Memorize exactly how you're doing that. Uh, let's take one small section uh, right here in the narration and we'll solo the narration and the music tracks. And since I have them inversely locked together, I'll go through and mix them just a little bit. I'll tweak them just a little bit so that the narration punches out just a little bit more over the volume of the music. So I guess that's a good place to start for reset start. And I only have to grab one or the other. I can either grab the music or the narration because they're inversely locked. So we'll go ahead and reset play. Starring the Maniac Cop, Robert Zadar. Gary Daniels as the White Dragon. So we'll go ahead and play that back through again. And you'll notice now how the music comes down under the narration and then back up. Starring the Maniac Cop, Robert Zadar. Gary Daniels as the White Dragon. So the narration really punches through in those points. It's a little rough, it can be fine-tuned, but you can see how easy it is to adjust all of the volumes and pans right there in the mixer, have it memorize it, and play it back. Now that we've seen some of the powerful basic functions of Studio 16, let's go see how it's used in broadcast television. Dialogue editor David Scharf has edited on such shows as The Untouchables, Viper, Cheers, and many others. Hey, what my work requires is to record background ambiences and make loops out of them, extend them over scenes that have no background ambience at all to help smooth over edits. I need to remove lines of dialogue and prepare them for ADR. Um, there's a lot of tasks that the Studio 16 is uh, well suited for, and I hope to demonstrate that in here with this little sample production we've put together. Studio 16 is the most powerful hard disk recording system and digital audio editing system available. Studio 16 puts digital audio editing tools in the hands of those who before now could not afford them. Studio 16 uh, is the most affordable addition to your editing suite that you can imagine. Now if you noticed here at the beginning of course there's some ocean background which we added for these purposes and then we cut to another angle where there was no contamination in the background whatsoever. And in most cases what you want to do is continue that background ambience through the cut so that it appears to be natural and smooth um, as if you were really there rather than it being edited. And what I'm going to show is again how the Studio 16 can be used to fix that. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is find out where the first contamination stops. So I'm going to show you this one more time. Studio 16 is the most powerful hard disk recording system and digital audio editing system available. Okay, and right Studio there 16 is our cut. Digital audio editing. And watching the screen, I noticed that about 337 is where our contamination stopped. So with our sample here represented on the screen by this box, I can crop the end of it and stop the sample from playing back at the required point, which should be right about there. And hopefully as we go back, uh, you'll see it cut off as this scene changes. Studio 16 is the most powerful hard disk recording system and digital audio editing system available. So what I've done is I've stopped the sample playing at precisely the point where the contamination stops and of course the angle changes. And one of the nice things about Studio 16 here is I can capture the sample and pull it down if I do this correctly. 
so that it stays perfectly in sync. And now that's a clone of my original full length sample. And I'm going to adjust it so that by butting it up against the end of the sample here, I have a pre precise transition point and I can bring the sample down now and it will continue playing on this other track from the point where the contamination or the ocean stops and I'll demonstrate that right now. Studio 16 puts digital audio editing tools in the hands of those who before now could not afford them. Studio 16 uh, is... And again, we have the other transition to worry about. And somewhere in the neighborhood of 349 is where that ended. And I'll go back and adjust this or crop it. And if I need to, I can zoom in so I can see a little better here. And hopefully that point should be right at the transition point. I'm going to roll back and double check that real quick. Studio 16 puts digital audio editing tools in the hands of those who before now could not afford them. Now in a case like that I could hear a little bit of audio and what I can do is tug the, st the start mark back a little bit, um, give myself a start flag, and now every time I decide to trim back just a little bit to make sure I have all of the contamination out of this particular cut. I can play from that flag. And as you can hear, I've got no more contamination at that point, so it looks like I did the job. I'm going to zoom back out. And again, I'm going to clone this sample. It'll stay in sync as long as I have that particular icon highlighted. I'm going to pull the crop mark out to the end. Pull this one up, and again, when I use this to butt them side by side, I know that I'll have a smooth transition when I move it back. So now what we have, if you can follow my cursor, is a contaminated segment, another contaminated segment, and then a segment that's in the clear. Okay, now the next part of this particular process is to smooth the transition and prepare them for a continuation of the background contamination. Uh, again, Studio 16 uh, makes this uh, almost too easy. You grab the corner of the box and you pull it down slightly and you've created a fade. Um, I'm going to move this flag back here. I could set up another one, but this is a little faster. Bring the start mark back to the flag like that. You have the right track. And I'm going to play from here and you should be able to hear the fade out. I'm available. So right there you can hear the ocean slowly fade out. Now we're not hearing that sample because I don't have that track armed. Okay, now we're going to stop here and what I'm going to do is grab some of uh, this ocean. Right here is my sample list. Uh, this is the same ocean that we used to contaminate that track with. Uh, what I'm going to do is make sure that I don't keep the original time. I want to put this wherever I want. So I'm going to put it there in this track and move it around a little bit and I'm going to arm just these two tracks and again I'm going to make a nice little fade up by grabbing the corner and tilting it right about there. I've found it's nice to zoom in sometimes and get a real good look at what you're doing and you'll notice that this fades in quite a bit earlier and what we'll do is see if that sneaks into the track um, in a fashion that sounds smooth or that you don't notice at all. So I'm going to go back to my start flag. Digital audio editing system available. So up to that point, you can see that the ocean continued. It sounded like a somewhat of an abrupt change. So I'm going to, again, alter this just a little bit so that the transition between the two will be a little bit smoother. Then I'm going to clone this and I'm going to pull that up and extend it clear across. 
so that if I played this track all by itself, all you would hear is ocean fading up, ocean continuing, and ocean going down. And that will blend across from this side. And what I'm going to do here, before we even listen to it, is pull up this side. And I'm going to test it real quick. That's how easy you can test a fade up. Studio 16 uh, is the and most... what I noticed right away was that the fade up was into audio. I can turn it back. Studio 16... Uh, and I'll do it again. A little bit faster fade. Studio 16 uh, is the... And that should be adequate. I'm going to double check here by zooming in one more time. Sometimes a visual check can help. I'll go back. And I'm going to roll tape again here and see that when I bring it all the way back, if we're lucky, what we'll have is the first part of the dialogue and just nothing but the ocean across that middle part. And that will demonstrate the majority of this particular fix. Studio 16 is the most powerful hard disk recording system and digital audio editing system available. Studio 16 uh, is the most affordable addition to your editing suite that you can imagine. And what I'm going to do is uh, go back and fix another problem. If you heard that while it was going on, this middle segment was much too loud. And I'll show you how quick it is to fix that. I have a slider here that you can go in half dB increments if necessary. I'm going to get real drastic here and go to the minus 6. The same here. And we're going to see if that fixes the problem. I'm going to go one more time. And what we're looking for is a smoother transition, one that sounds as if nothing at all really occurred, just a nice smooth continuation of the ocean. What I heard was an increase uh, in the level of the ocean. So hopefully I just fixed that, and that part of the fix should be finished. Studio 16 is the most powerful hard disk recording system and digital audio editing system available. Studio 16 uh, is the most affordable addition to your editing suite that you can imagine. As you can see, this is a common fix. I use this uh, probably 50% of the time on uh, television shows. And this drastically cut down the amount of time that it took for me to accomplish this sort of edit. And um, a lot of times I used to use my hands on faders. And in this particular instance, this is much more reliable and winds up being quicker because you don't have to make repeated moves to, to capture the desired effect. Now what I'm going to do here is, well, I'll leave this on and I'm going to solo that track. And I'm going to listen to this one real quick. Quick key combination. Studio 16 puts digital audio editing tool. Okay. Now all we have here is hum, but what I want to do is come up into that hum smoothly. Studio 16 puts digital audio... Uh, and again, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so I can do a little bit more detailed work. As you can see, I'm 2.25 seconds into the fade, which is really nice to know. You have that information right there. Studio 16 puts digital audio editing tool... So that's that side, and what I'm going to do is tug the other corner for a fade out and go for approximately the same slope, somewhere in the same direction, and I'm going to play the sample from beginning to end. Studio 16 puts digital audio editing tools in the hands of those who before now could not afford them. Now even though there's hum on that particular track, uh, with all this ocean background, that probably won't be noticed. The nice thing about this, though, is that if you want, you can uh, go back and filter that out if you wanted, because the track is isolated now. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, play all three tracks together with the video from the beginning. And I think what we're going to find, I'll predict that this track will probably be a little too quiet, but I'm not going to change it right now. I'm going to go back and take a look.
Studio 16 is the most powerful hard disk recording system and digital audio editing system available. Studio 16 puts digital audio editing tools in the hands of those who before now could not afford them. Studio 16 uh, is the most affordable addition to your editing suite that you can imagine. Okay, what I want to do now is fix a problem with the dialogue. You may have noticed where Tony said the word ah. Uh. I'm going to see if I can remove that and fill through with some of that ocean ambience. And I'm also going to demonstrate that you can take that ocean ambience directly from the dialogue track itself, which is always the most desirable way to fix these kinds of problems. So to start that process, I'm going to begin by cloning that particular portion of the track. Uh, and leaving that aside for right now, I'm going to go right back up and start by trying to get rid of the word uh. So I'm going to crop all the way back. I'm going to zoom in so I can do a little bit more detailed work. Then I'm going to play that sample. Studio 16. Okay, that's not bad. I'm going to extend and find exactly where that uh, starts. Studio 16. One more time. Studio 16. Uh. Okay, and what I want, of course, is as much of the dialogue in the clear as possible. Studio 16. Studio 16. And I'm going to a little bit more for extra measure. Fairly fast process, and now I can fade. One last demonstration. Studio 16. Okay. Now what I'm going to do, I believe, is go back here and take my clone and get past the word uh. I'm going to zoom again. And I do believe that fade up is a little too long. Uh, is the most of Okay. Now I'm only cropping here. Is the most affordable. And this these moves uh, of course don't change the sync at all. Uh, is the most affordable. Is the most affordable. Okay, now I think I've got the start point right. I'm going to fade a little smoother into the dialogue. Is the most affordable addition to your editing suite. Okay. Now I'm going to move that back up where it belongs, and uh, hopefully uh, when I play that through, you'll be able to hear exactly what I've done before I go any further, which is to remove the word uh, and you'll also hear the background ambience go away, which is the first stage of this process. Studio 16 is the most affordable addition to your editing suite okay. that you can imagine. That's step one. The next step is that if memory serves, at the end of the sample there is plenty of ambience, so, or ocean, I'm going to clone this again and see if I can find a segment of the ocean in the clear right from the same track. Okay, very short. And I'm going to go for as much as I can get. Actually, I think that'll be more than adequate. Now, what I want to do is go into a different mode where I can slide the sample around and bring it in here where I really want it. Now, remembering that this is coming from the original sample that's residing up here. So you can section off and pull down and move all from the same sample and do it at will with no fear of uh, any problems or whoops, mix-ups. There's another nice feature. Uh, if you want to uh, bounce two tracks together like that, you don't actually have to change the fade-up. Quick demonstration. And I'm going to go with that. I have to play both of these. For actually, I'm going to go back in this mode, pull this sample down, and just play these two outer ones so you can hear how the ocean hopefully fills through where the word uh was removed. Here we go. Studio 16 is the most affordable addition to your editing suite that you can imagine. 
All right, now that we've completed all of our editorial work, what we may want to do is to combine all these tracks together into one sample, mix them all together so that we have one long sample with the final results of all of our work. So I'm going to go through that process here uh, fairly rapidly. I'm going to pull our cue list down, make some room here. I'm going to add an audio track, and I'm going to tell this audio track that I want it to record the output of the Studio 16. Um, I can also name the sample here. Um, mix isn't too bad. I could also name the track if I want. And go back here. So now we have final. I can activate that track get it ready to do recording and you can see here that I have my record in, my punch in flag in and out. You can adjust that rapidly if you want or of course you can double click on them and put them in numerically if you want to but for this purpose I don't think I have to do that. Um, now I activate the tracks that I want to play back and I'm going to swing back and see if I can record this from beginning to end. Studio 16 is the most powerful hard disk recording system and digital audio editing system available. Studio 16 puts digital audio editing tools in the hands of those who before now could not afford them. Studio 16 is the most affordable addition to your editing suite that you can imagine. Okay, we'll stop. I'm going to go back and deactivate all of these tracks, take it out of record, and play back that final combined track. Studio 16 is the most powerful hard disk recording system and digital audio editing system available. Studio 16 puts digital audio editing tools in the hands of those who before now could not afford them. Studio 16 is the most affordable addition to your editing suite that you can imagine. Okay, as you can see, we've just successfully removed a word of dialogue. We've extended a background fill over an angle that had no background fill to begin with, and given the, uh, the whole segment a uh, professional sound. Uh, the nice part of this is it's done very rapidly and intuitively with Studio 16, and I think you can see for yourself that uh, this makes short work out of these kinds of problems. So as you can see, whether you're doing film work or broadcast television dialogue editing, or just industrial videos. As you get into Studio 16 more and more, I'm sure you'll find ways to use its tools to advance your video production.